Come on, bless God for our bishop again. And he, he kicked us off last night with an incredible word, and it is preaching time now at this midday service. There is a preacher in the house on this afternoon. If you have never before heard the Reverend Shalita Fomby, you will not forget her after today. She served so faithfully at the Reed Temple AME Church, and she has been serving there for many, many years, assisting uh, with Pastor Lee Washington and with... Uh, assistant pastor Matt Watley, but she is somebody's preacher. I wish you'd look at your neighbor and tell him to hold on, hold on, hold on, get ready for the word of God. I've known her for many, many years, and it has been just a joy to watch what God is doing in and through her ministry. She was a featured preacher last year at the Hampton University Ministers Conference, and she is indeed preaching all across this country, even as she serves faithfully at one of the sites of the Reed Temple Church just before she comes to stand. We're going to be blessed again by our guest psalmist this year, Ronette Harrison. What a wonderful gift she is to the body of Christ. She serves faithfully at the New Macedonia Church in Washington, D.C. I met her many years ago when we were both singing uh, background for now Bishop C. Guy Robinson. Amen. And it's amazing watching how God moves people from glory to glory. She has her own project out now entitled Journey. She's just coming off of a week of engagement at Blues Alley in Washington, D.C. And she indeed is traveling all over the nation as a featured soloist and singer and God is using her so mightily. So won't you receive her again? And then the next voice you hear will be that of the Reverend Shalita Fomby. Can you give a warm KCP welcome again to our psalmist, Ronette Harrison. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Am I standing in the right spot? All right. So I wanted to do uh, a very simple song that I know you guys are very familiar with, and it's by the maestro himself, Richard Smallwood, called Total Praise. And I like to sing songs like that just to kind of set the atmosphere and um, make preaching easy. Hallelujah. So um, am I in D flat? Okay. I want to take my time on the first one. All right. <clears throat> Lord, I will lift my
give you glory. We bless your holy name, Jesus. We honor you, Lord, in this place. Oh, we give you reverence, Jesus. We worship you, Lord, for there is none like you, Jesus. There is none like you, Lord, in all. Better than that, to exalt the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Grab your neighbor by the hand, amen. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Can you grab your neighbor by the hand? Hallelujah. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, every heart is open, every spirit is praying. Father, we thank you and we glorify you on today. God, we come giving you our praises and we come giving you, God, our worship. We glorify you and we thank you for bringing us into sacred space on this afternoon. God, we thank you because this is the place wherein, Lord, we can hear from heaven. And so, God, it is our prayer that you would speak now, for your servants are indeed listening. Hide me behind this sacred desk, cover me under the drippings of your blood, that I might not make a name for myself, but that your name, God, will be made famous in all the earth. Get the glory for yourself. God, we stand on your word and we stand on your promises. For you said that you sent your word to heal them. Now, God, heal, save, and deliver as only you can. And it is in Jesus' name that every heart and mind say amen. 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 Come on and loose those hands and give God glory. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. While you're thanking God for Jesus, can you help me to thank God, amen, for the presiding prelate of this wonderful association in this conference. Amen. Certainly we salute. Amen. Bishop Walter Thomas. Y'all can make a little bit more noise. Amen. We salute the leadership. Amen. Of this gathering. John Maxwell says that everything rises and falls on leadership. And certainly we thank God for the rising tide. Amen. That is the Kingdom Association of Covenant Pastors. And we cannot salute the bishop without amen, giving glory and honor. Amen. For the wonderful woman that walks with him in ministry and in life. Amen. We thank God for Lady Thomas. Can we just make some noise for her? Amen. We certainly acknowledge all of the distinguished council members of this incredible gathering. I am humbled. And amen, the truth of the matter is I'm just scared, y'all. Amen. <laughs> to be able to stand and to proclaim the unsearchable riches of the glorious gospel. But if you have your sword, amen, I would that you would grab it and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, certainly we thank God for so many mighty uh, pastors and preachers and leaders, amen, of the gospel. I thank God for your ministry. It's been a blessing to me over the years. And certainly I stand on the shoulders of my pastor, my leadership, Reverend Dr. Lee P. Washington. Thank God for him and releasing me to share, amen, and my spiritual mentor and brother, Reverend Matthew Watley. Ezekiel chapter 37, amen, Ezekiel chapter 37, the word this afternoon can be found, amen, around the fourth verse, 4 through 10 of Ezekiel, chapter 37. And when you have it, can you signify by saying amen? Amen. If you're standing beside somebody that does not have their word, please be kind enough, Christian enough, to share your word with them. But right there in Ezekiel, chapter 37, the word of God says, Then he said to me, 
prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared to them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army. Amen. Before taking your seat, I would that you would look at your neighbor on your left or right and smile. Come on, smile at them and say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, my dear neighbor. This is a celebration of restoration. Come on, look at the neighbor on the other side and say, neighbor. Oh, my dear neighbor. This is a celebration of restoration. If you believe God is about to restore some things as you go to your seat, just give them a hand clap of praise on this afternoon. And certainly as we extend our congratulations to the bishop on such a wonderful uh, gathering, we also extend condolences, amen, as he continues to walk with his family in the morning of the matriarch of their family, amen. This is a celebration for restoration. Beloved, there are three essential elements or attributes um, that I believe that every Christian, every child of God ought to know concerning the nature of their God. You should know, first of all, that God is omniscient, meaning that God has all knowledge. You, you also know, because you're educated, that, that God is omnipresent, meaning that God is everywhere all at the same time, and there's nowhere where God isn't. You, you also know, church, that God is omnipotent, meaning that God is El Shaddai. He, he possesses all power. And God's infinite and eternal power is even praised and attested to in creation. For for the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. That that means that even if we decided on this afternoon to, to sit on our hands and even to sit on our praise, how many know it's of no consequence to God because God will never find himself without a witness? But, but, but even creation itself testifies to the fact, amen, that power belongs to God. You might have a position, but David says that power belongs to God. You, you might have a bit of delegated authority, but how many know power? Uh-huh. It, it belongs to God. Dr. Hell, I know somebody gave us a button and a badge and a title, but, but how many know at the end of the day, power belongs to God? And because we serve a God of eternal supremacy, and sovereignty, that that means that nothing that I get myself into can the power of God not get me out of. The, the, The psalmist said it this way, that power and might are in his hands. It's not in your supervisor's hands. It's it's not in the loan officer's hands. And thank God it's not in Trump's hands. But, But power belongs to God. 
And because God has all power, that means that all things now are possible. The, the, the good news that I came to declare this afternoon is that the infinite power of God is able to neutralize every threat of impossible situations. Uh, understand, beloved, that whenever it is that God saves you, at that same time, he also favored you. And the favor of God over your life can never be broken. You might be broken, but I said the blessing, the, the hesed, the loving kindness, the favor of God over your life can never be broken. I know that might be difficult for somebody to understand because maybe you're here this afternoon and you've been crying years of tears and you find yourself in a place of discouragement where your condition contradicts your calling but I came to whisper a word of hope in somebody's heart that God will restore God will rebuild God will revive God will reassemble every broken and fragmented area of your life whatever the damage whatever the destruction how many know it doesn't matter whether or not you've lost your joy or whether or not you've lost your job I'm so glad that the God we serve can repurpose the remnants of our life and take us from a place of ruin to restoration that that that's why the book says that he says I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten the canker worm and the palmer worm that's why it doesn't matter how great a loss you've suffered how many know you can lose everything you can lose your position you can lose your marriage you can lose your relationship and still make it back as long as you don't lose faith in the God that restores and that's a good word for somebody because you've come disillusioned by a dream that's been deferred because how many know at the end of the day when life doesn't go the way you anticipated and when life starts lifing you you've got to understand that your circumstances do not get the last word in your life no God gets the last word the facts don't get the last word your finances don't get the last word your failures don't even get the last word but God gets the last word and it's not over until God says that it's over and when God decides to intervene and in that which death tried to intercept how many know that the grave has no choice but to give up what grace demands here it is the Bible says that Ezekiel y'all is a priest and a prophet out of the house of Israel that he spent the last 36 chapters talking about the judgment that has befallen Israel because of their sin and their rebellion so God has allowed them to go into Babylonian captivity and as a consequence of their idolatrous hearts they find that their lives have been decimated by destruction I know we don't preach it much anymore but I said that sin caused them to lose fellowship with God that their disobedience brought about disconnection and as a result of their disconnection God has caused everything in their life to dry up they have been displaced from their homeland they are dispirited in their hearts and they're divided in their devotion sin has a way of taking you further than you ever wanted to go costing you more than you ever wanted to pay and God knows keeping you longer than you ever wanted to stay but how many know I'm so glad that where sin abounds grace abounds all the more that even when we miss the mark we serve a covenant keeping God and God is so committed to redeeming his people that whether or not you're on the mountaintop or whether or not you find yourself in a valley God is able to restore you back to your rightful position and he can bring a revival right there in the valley the Bible says that Ezekiel now is driven out by the hand 
hand of the Lord into a valley of dry bones. I said that God situates him in a metaphorical graveyard that depicts the disinherited and disenfranchised condition of the household of Israel. He's standing right there looking at death all around him and he has to wonder how in the world is God going to bring forth life in such a dead situation. But look at how God resources him because not only does God place him in a valley but now God also equips him with a vision. So I asked them God why would you give him a vision in the valley? And God said because as long as you have a vision you can't play the victim. Because when you're the victim you can only see what's happening to you. But how many know when you have a vision it will make you look at what's happening inside of you despite what's going on around you. And it's right there in the midst of this situation that God begins his interrogation. God asks Ezekiel a very probative and a very provocative question and he says, son of man, yes, can these bones live? I know it looks hopeless from your vantage point. I know that things look impossible from where you sit in life. I know things appear to be broken beyond repair. But look again now and tell me whether or not you think these bones can live. God wants to know how it is that Ezekiel sees the situation because God understands that the loosening of imagination is critical to any hope of survival because it's not the reality of your situation that threatens you but how many know it's how it is that you see your situation that makes all the difference. Do you realize church that whenever it is you engage holy imagination that you are in fact futuring your faith that when you engage holy imagination you are in fact saying that there's no past pain and there's no present day problem that's superior to my not yet future. I think that's what William Blakely was saying the English poet from the 17th century when he penned these words and he said life's dim windows of the soul distorts the heavens from pole to pole and causes you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. So what God wants to know is are you looking at the situation or are you looking into the situation. In other words, even though things aren't coming together right now, they're not looking as if you would want them to, even though life looks very fragmented and life looks very disjointed, can you see with the eyes of faith beyond what is and begin to imagine what can be? Son of man can. Uh -huh. the, these bones live. It's an important question because what God is saying is that I'm not asking you to evaluate the reality, uh -huh. but, but I'm asking you to evaluate the potentiality. I, I know, Ezekiel, you're distracted by what's going on around you, but I want to birth a new vision in your life. So even if I don't take you out of the situation, you can still survive in in the situation because you have a fresh revelation about the situation. Are you able to look beyond your current circumstance and see new possibilities in the midst of old problems? I know you're looking at destruction, but can I tell you that the gift of imagination and creative cogitation is, is, is the gift that it says that can you paint a picture on the canvas of your pain because how many know that's the artistry of ministry that when you can look at a situation and you can look beyond the situation and you can see what it is God is calling you to do I just stopped by to tell somebody this afternoon that one of the most radical forms of resistance that a dreamer or a visionary can ever have is the absurdity of hope a hope that refuses to accept the reading of 
of your present day reality, a hope whose faith is energized by a holy imagination, a hope that can conceive of a new resurrected reality rising out of the ashes. Because the relevant question on this afternoon is not how big is your dream, but the question is how fertile is your imagination? God asked the man, can these bones live? And I love the way Ezekiel answers the question because he responds, oh Lord God, you know. And my prayer this afternoon, church, is that God will invoke a vision so great in your heart and so expansive that the only way it can ever possibly come to pass is if God does it himself. Ezekiel could not answer the question, but he says, oh God, only you know, because God showed him something so vast that he didn't even know how to respond to it. And I don't know where you are on today, but how many know I'm ready for God to show me something that will stretch my faith. I want God to show me something that will push me beyond the boundaries of my complacency. I don't want God to show me something that I can handle. I don't want God to show me something that I can manage. I don't want a vision that can fit in my two hands, but I want God, yes, to show me something so great and grand that it scares me. I want God to show me something that I don't even know who it is I can call to say, guess what the Lord showed me. You ought want God to show you something that confounds your cognitive abilities and humbles your intellect. Is there anybody in here who knows that there's a vision that God wants to sow in your heart that will have you scratching your head saying, God, I don't have the resources. God, I don't have the connections. God, I don't have the social network. But I hear God saying, that's good because it's not your job to figure out how you're going to do it. It's just your job to trust that it will be done. God shows Ezekiel a vision in a valley of corpse and dry bones. And listen, y'all, if your vision is about you getting a promotion and about you going to another level and about you getting married, how many know that's a good vision? But that's not a God vision because a God-sized vision always makes a God-sized impact. Notice God didn't ask Ezekiel whether or not he saw a vision for his life. No, God said, can these bones live? And as long as you continue to live a self-centered, self-concentrated life that only focuses on you, then how many know God can birth a new vision in your life? But when you begin to move beyond your own self, how many know that's when God can use you as a catalyst for change? Can I ask you a question? Who's rejoicing right now because they've been a benefactor of your spiritual imagination? Because what God wants to know is, is your vision so small that you can only see me moving in your life? Or do you have enough faith to believe me for somebody? Can you pray for somebody else's ministry? Can you celebrate somebody else's elevation? Will you give your neighbor high five and say, I'll pray for you and you pray for me and watch Watch God change it. I got to get out of the way. But but he's looking at a valley full of dry bones. Understand, y'all, it's not just one or two deaths, but it's representative of a communal death of the whole entire household of Israel. In other words, these are church folk who have died. But God has never been able to tolerate a dead church. So he moves now from interrogation to proclamation and God says Ezekiel prophesy uh -huh, to the bones preach to the bones it, it was Walter Brueggemann who said that the consciousness of prophetic imagination must always now be tethered to a linguistic concern in other words Ezekiel must not only have the hope of a visionary but now he must also learn how to speak the language of a visionary because how many know that 
that when it is you're in a dry place and when it is that you're in a low land, a place of no hope, a place of no help, a place where there's no, no insight or no inspiration, how many know that it's the word of God that begins to satiate your dry and bearing soul? And when things in your life are so broken and so disenfranchised, it's the word that begins the process of reorienting some very disorienting times in your life. Now, I'm not talking about a shallow kind of a word, but I'm talking about a faith-filled expression that will penetrate and veto every doubt, every demon, every depression that would come to dissuade you from what it is God has ordained for your life. And if you want to experience change in your environment, then how many know you can't sit there and remain muted in your misery? No, brother, you've got to open up your mouth and you've got to speak change into the atmosphere because life and death uh -huh, are in the power of the tongue. And God's word has the power to penetrate every dead situation. You don't believe me? I dare you to ask a dead man named Lazarus whether or not he believes that God's word is a penetrating power. I'm trying to get somebody in here to understand that you can't let the valley rob you of your voice, but you've got to exercise the authority that has been given unto you. You've got to understand that you have the authority of God's word. For the earth was framed by the word of God. The seas were framed by the word of God. The firmament was brought forth by the word of God. Every creeping thing that ever creeped upon the face of the earth was able to do so how? By the word of God. That's why it doesn't matter how dry or how barren your situation is. The word has the power to find you, yes, and to quench you and to satiate your thirst so that out of your belly, yes, will come rivers of living water. Okay, John said it this way. He said that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John said that there was nothing that was created that was not first formed. How? By the word. In other words, Jesus, yes, is that linguistic bridge that brings order up out of my chaos. Then the word became flesh and it dwelt among us and we beheld the glory of the begotten of the Father that's full of grace and truth and whosoever believeth in what in the word will not perish but will have everlasting life. In other words, if the word gave me life, then when I speak it, that same word has to give life. So God says, Ezekiel, since you're the only one in here with life in an otherwise dead situation, it's your responsibility to speak life into the atmosphere. And here's what's going to happen when you speak it, man. That the power of that prophetic utterance is going to locate every dead and dormant area in your life so that dead bones get up and start dancing. Because how many know the number one assignment of death is always to silence you? But God never said that the redeemer will never go through a low moment. God never said that the redeemer will never go through a difficult time. But what did he say? He said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I dare you to open your mouth right through here and begin to speak a word of life to your dead situation because the devil is upset. He thought that after everything you've been through this year, he thought that certainly by now you would have crawled up in a corner, that you would have been curling your weave and you've been sucking your thumb. But what the enemy of your soul fails to understand is that it's the ministry of the spoken word that's always efficacious 
for ushering in new life. And God sent me here to tell somebody that you have the power to talk yourself out of the hell that you're going through right now. I know somebody gave you divorce papers, but baby, you can talk your way out of it. I know they're trying to foreclose on your house, but you can talk your way out of it. Is there anybody in here who knows that you've got the power to speak to every dead situation? Ezekiel was the only one in a valley of dry bones because sometimes you don't get the revelation until you find yourself in isolation. But is there anybody in here with the Davidic spirit that knows how to encourage your very own soul? Ever found yourself in a dry season and you encourage yourself in the shower? Encourage yourself in the house? Encourage yourself in the car? I need you to open your black mouth and give God glory because there's a I got to get out of here. The Bible says that he preached to the bones. I'm done. And then the Bible says that that which was disentombed began to come back to life. Because even though they had the appearance of life, there was no spirit inside of them. Because how many know we real good for looking good on the outside? But we just as broken and we just as wounded and we ain't got no joy and we ain't got no inspiration. So Ezekiel began to preach to the four winds. And I don't know where you are on today, but I've lived enough life to know that my prayer isn't, God, give me a new car. God, give me a new man. No, I didn't have all that. But how many know a time comes when you ought to pray for the spirit, that the spirit of heaven would fall fresh on you? Is there anybody in here who says, I don't need more recognition, and I don't need more money, and I don't don't need another honey, but I need the spirit of the living Lord to fall fresh on me, fall on my family, fall on my heart, fall on my spirit. I got to get out of here. But understand, y'all, that because this was a communal death, that meant it was a communal resurrection. In other words, God was saying that since I know that y'all know how to come together, what I really want to know is do y'all know how to stand together. But when all God's children begin to get together, how many know what a day of rejoicing that will be? That's why the enemy loves to stir up confusion in the church because he knows that a house divided against itself cannot stand. But would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, let's stay together. I dare you to look at the one on the other side and say, neighbor, let's stay together. I dare you to give somebody a high five and say, let's stay together because the body of Christ is edified by every joint that it supplieth. I dare you to look at somebody and say, I need a joint. I need a joint. I don't need that kind of joint, but I need a joint that will pray with me. I need a joint that will fast with with me. I need a joint that would help me see God's best for my life. Would you help me preach it in your best Al Green voice and say, let's let's stay together because one will chase a thousand but two will put ten thousand to flight. Let's stay together because a three strand cord is not easily broken. Let's stay together in the spirit of unity. Let's stay together Together. Ain't no division among us. Ain't no jealousies among us. Ain't no schisms among us. No sexism. No denominationalism. Would you find somebody and say we're in this together? Because if the devil wants to get to one of us, he's got to go through all of us. Because when one weeps, the other weeps. And when one rejoices, the other rejoices. Because not only do we come together, and not only do we stand together, but the Bible says that they got up and they came out together. Would you pull on your neighbor one last time and say, neighbor.
labor. You're coming out of this. You're coming out alive. You're coming out with your mind intact. You're coming out with your joy intact. You're coming out with all your stuff. You're coming out with a shout. That's why today is a day of celebration for restoration because it was one year ago today that mommy went in the hospital and she would never come out again. And I've spent the last seven months of my life trying to figure out will I always cry like this? Will my heart always be broken? But God remembered and he brought it to my mind. He said there's no grief that's so great that the grace of God can bring you out of the grave. How do you know? Because late one Friday night, they put my Savior in a borrowed tomb, in the tomb of Joseph, Arimathea, and he died all night Friday, and he died all night Saturday, but early Sunday morning, he got up with all power. Would you look at your neighbor and say, oh, death, where is that grave? Oh, stay, where is that victory? I stopped by to tell you that it's a celebration for restoration and everything you lost. God will restore. Your joy is coming back. Your marriage is coming back. Your mind is coming back. Your honor is coming back. Your reputation is coming back. Say yeah. Yeah. Give God some glory. He restored my soul. I'm done. Whatever. Stir up the imagination. Because the more you stir it, it's a futuring of your faith. I'm done. That catapults you beyond your today. Didn't know how the day was going to go, to be honest. Woke up heavy. But I thank God that there's grace beyond the grief and grace beyond the grave. Come on, put your hands together for resurrection power. I said for getting up power. For a comeback spirit. Tell somebody you can't die right here. But there's a greater vision. There's a greater purpose that God has in mind. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, bless God for the Reverend Shalita Fombie. My God, my God. 